Is Statesville, Georgia on the line? Yeah, yeah, we're on the line. Okay, thank you. Delavan, Illinois. Yes, we're here. Cherokee, Iowa. Here. Uh, Marlette, Michigan. Here. Stewart, Minnesota. Here. Okay, Napoleon, North Dakota. We're on. Leipzig, Ohio. Yes, we're here. This is the roll call of a phone conference set up to interconnect 204 NFO grain price lift meetings. These gatherings of grain producers were held simultaneously all across the vast grain belt of the United States on the 15th and 16th of January. In his office, we recorded NFO President Devon Woodland as he addressed those meetings. Let me suggest to you that there is no increase for agriculture in that farm bill. There will be no increase in farm income. The secretary has brought authority and as late as of Monday of this week, he lowered the loan rate and the support price allowed by the farm bill. Now, this automatically set the markets for the year 1986. Now, with changing of the guard among the secretary that's about to take place, let me assure you that it will be the same philosophy, the same farm bill, the same programs, and again, there's nothing in there for agriculture producers. Here's the plan of the NFO. We're asking you to commit one load or a minimum of 10% of the grain you have in storage for immediate bargaining for negotiators to begin to negotiate for that volume. One semi-load per grower or 10% of the grain with no restrictions attached. Here's where Woodland tells the grain meetings the direction we're headed if grain producers do nothing. The president said since the resignation of the secretary that we must pull the rug out from under farmers very slowly and very carefully so that we don't cause a revolution but an evolution. 1990 is the year set for farm programs to be discontinued what I would like to do is make a sincere appeal to you in this meeting today. Join with this greatest of all efforts to unify agriculture. Devon Woodland is here today, president of the NFO. I'm going to ask him to tell about it. How about some of the numbers? How many meetings were there altogether? There was actually 205 meetings held. Uh, and uh, at one time we would have uh, 65 connected and... Uh, at another period of time, 40, 50, and so on, but 205 meetings. And we reached in excess of 4,000 people. And that was our goal, was to reach out with a program that we uh, felt very uh, firm and very strong about. And as we went through the program and explained to those in attendance, they readily admitted, hey, you know, that will work. It will work. And so they began to put uh, grain together for us to work with. And we're approaching 3 million now, but the important thing this is... This is 3 million bushels, three million bushels. total from the, all these meetings. That's right. And what the important thing is, is what happens after the meeting atmosphere. Yeah, begins. right. You know, it's a very private thing when you sit with an individual farmer and begin to talk to him about his operation, his volume, how much, and, and so forth. And so in a public type atmosphere, he's somewhat uh, hesitant to talk about it. And that's understandable. But we're now going out and uh, meeting with... Uh, smaller groups, four or five, maybe on the farm uh, contact. And it's there that we sit with them and, uh, and get them involved. And, and we're seeing uh, some productive results from the follow-up activity. Now, this is going to be in a block that will be available for bargaining for better prices, right? That's right. We know that you have to be in the market to cause the market to react. And the organization's concept years ago was block and hold. And today we're talking about blocking and selling. And so this means then that uh, you put this uh, massive volume together and anyone knows that if you operate on uh, volume, you can merit a premium. And so it takes grain to cause markets to react. You have to be in the market. Well, I'm sure that there are literally thousands of grain producers all across America who are wishing you well in all this. Well, we're doing it for farmers, and the theme, of course, is farmer helping farmer. And uh, anyone who's been following the farm picture knows that there has to be something different done than's been done in the last several uh, generations. And uh, the thing that has to be done differently is the way you approach the market, and the way we have traditionally approached the market is our downfall. Every commodity was discussed recently, 
In a seminar on farm bargaining, Merle Sunken, head of the NFO Hog Division, talked about day-ahead pricing, one of the contracting techniques of the National Farmers Organization. This organization has tried and proven that if you can bargain for hogs today, schedule them into the collection points, and make the negotiations on them this day and deliver them to the collection point or to that packing plant tomorrow, you have a tendency to keep price pressure on the market because there's no competitor out there tomorrow wants to come out and pay something lower than what you are receiving. So consequently, day ahead pricing does keep price pressure on the market. In grade and yield transactions negotiated by national farmers, the hog producer gets 80% of his payment immediately. Merle Sunken tells how this works. 80% payment on, gar on grade and yield hogs. 80% payment no matter whether you move them through the collection point or whether you take them as a direct shipper to whatever packing plant they're negotiated for. At the time those hogs are unloaded and weighed, you can receive 80% advance payment on your grade and yield hogs on all of our programs. Then in about four or five days, you'll receive a balance of that 20% along with a copy of your kill sheet. That's something that this organization has developed and tried and is a very, very workable program and no one else except for one other company has it at this time that I uh, am aware of. He takes note of the guaranteed trust protected checks throughout NFO transactions. Through this program and through a trust protected system with a meat reserve to back it up, I'm assured my check as a producer. That's a pretty good feeling and no one else has that kind of security. And finally, Merle Sunken makes a point about consistently selling hogs above $50. If you'll take those past four and a half years, four years and nine months to be exact, you could have contracted or cash flowed your operations and never sold a hog under $50. How many people in this room, and don't hold up your hand, please, how many people in this room, just think about it, have had a $50 hog market for four and a half, four and three quarters consecutive years? This organization has. Think about it. Do you really want the cash flow agriculture? Because if you do, you have the program available if we don't get greedy. We heard highlights today from Merle Sunken's talk about cash flowing agriculture during a recent discussion of bargaining in every commodity. We're in West Central Iowa with crews in the country. Hello, how are you doing? This is Jack Cruz and I'm at the West Side Collection Point. West Side Collection Point just had a board meeting, and we've got Ted Golovit sitting to my left. Ted, uh, we've got a, in the month of December, we shipped 3,513 hogs, an average 878 head uh, per week. Do you, have you noticed any difference in the activity here? Well, I think it's just wonderful. We've come up from uh, probably 250 head, clear on up to uh, 3,513, and uh, the activity around here, you wouldn't believe. It's not the same old point at all anymore. It's okay. really wonderful. To his uh, left, we've got our point secretary, uh, LaVon Von Ami. Because a lot of people don't understand. Uh, when they come here uh, and they go grade and yield, they get 80% of their check while they're standing here uh, on the weights uh, from our scale. The other 20% they get in about four days after the hogs have been killed and we get the results. But do, have you seen some results, uh, changes in that, LaVon? Yes, there's been a lot of changes. Some guys have come in and, you know, figured they won't be getting their check and we just tell them, well, just wait a few minutes, we got your check for you, you got 80% of it, and they're real happy with it. They get the money ahead of time where other places they don't. Uh, Ron Hodney, we're talking about the grade and yield program versus live buy because uh, most of the people up here, the vast majority, had been going live by. Now with the Great Yield Program, Ron, what would you say the percentage is? Uh, Jack, I would say probably uh, 75 to 80 percent of the hogs that go through here go Great Yield, and a big reason that they do that is because most places where you go to sell Great Yield, they take the whole works and weigh them, and that's the way they are. Where here at the Collection Point on West Side, we'll take these hogs if you've got some hogs that are too big or some hogs that are too small that are going to work into that 
high price of the meat that they have for that day. Well, we'll take those hogs and sort them out and send them live by, and the balance of the hogs that we think that are going to work is grade and yield, they'll go grade and yield. So uh, I would have to say that we're probably working real close to that 80%. We're hoping to get a bigger percentage than that in the future. This Jack Cruz. We're sitting here at the West Side Collection Point at West Side, Iowa. Cruz in the country. One of the most significant stories in agriculture these days, as it becomes painfully clear that the government's public policy for agriculture is to squeeze prices downward, more and more farmers and ranchers are flocking together. Another aspect of the public policy farmers have to live with these days is the USDA's announcement in January that there would be a program to buy out whole dairy herds, which of course would get rid of the dairy farmer as such. Ted Strait of NFO Dairy Department tells about it. The USDA has released the first statement on implementation of the new dairy herd buyout provision of the 1985 Farm Act. The program is to become effective by April 1st. To participate, a dairy producer must sell for slaughter or export all dairy cows, heifers, and calves. If a producer's bid is accepted, he also must stay out of the dairy production for five years and not allow his milk producing facility to be used by anyone during that period. Secretary John Block's initial announcement of the program emphasized that a producer bidding to sell out will have to furnish evidence of the size of his herd on January 1, 1985, January 1, 1986, and on the dates the bid is submitted. This refers to cows, heifers, and calves. Any quick change in the composition of the herd may affect the eligibility to bid. The first announcement set forth only these details, but more will be forthcoming soon. Number one, the producer must submit monthly records of milk marketings from July 84 through December 1985. A producer's base period will be the smaller of the milk marketings for the 12-month period beginning July 84 or January 85. Number two, the producer may bid one or more times in the following time periods, which are April 1st, 1986 to August 31st, 86, from September 1st, 86 to February 28th, 87, or March 1st, 87 to August 31st, 1987. The secretary may accept or reject all or any bids. The third is the successful bidders will have options as to payment arrangements. Number one, they can have equal annual payments, or two, no payment the first year, and then he can take equal annual payments or up to 85% in the second year with the balance spread over the remaining years of the contract, or payment in the first year up to 80% with the balance paid in equal annual installments. No information has yet been available on the actual bidding procedure. Ted Strait of NFO's Dairy Department. And now we hear from Andy Nutzling of the Slaughter Cattle Division to point out how this USDA dairy herd policy would affect the beef industry. Many marketing analysts predict an extra 800,000 dairy cows will be slaughtered in 1986 due to the whole herd dairy buyout program. This would produce about 2% more red meat than a year ago. However, many of those analysts are forgetting about the 5 to 6 percent fewer cattle placed on feed in 1985 and to be slaughtered in 1986. 800,000 cows would represent just about last week's total federal inspected slaughter, which was 768,000 head. That means the 800,000 cows could be just one week's kill. However, we will see a 4 to a 6 percent de decrease in our total cattle on feed. What I'm saying is we could slaughter all the 800,000 dairy, extra dairy cows and still have less pounds of beef on the market than a year ago. Andy Nutzling of the Slaughter Cattle Division. This concludes the county informational tape for NFO meetings in February, compiled and edited by Don Mack, director of the broadcast division. I'm Phil Allen. And that, for this month, is something to think about.